cross like Jesus died on. They had the cross. It was just a T. That was nice. They hang up there. They actually throw just enough to get the bird to come down. Maybe you throw down the stuff. You know, the wrong one. You know, the thing that is about the cross, who did it? Did Jesus the only one that died on the cross? Yeah. What was the cross? Capital punishment. Jesus grew up under the shadow of the cross. And Jesus said, uh, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to die on the cross. And uh, it really threw the apostles because they expected Jesus to set up a kingdom. And the kingdom that he was going to set up was, his, was a kingdom that was in the hearts of men, not in the, not in the national in charge. Jesus told a story of uh, the Jews. He said, now when you live like I live, the Romans would have you carry their package one mile. That was the law. Any Roman that came to you could say, I want you to carry my package, my suitcase, my, my burdens for one mile. What did Jesus say about that? Jesus said, the Romans want you to carry it one mile. If you're a good Christian, you carry it two miles. Jesus said, if somebody asks me for my coat, I should give them my cloak also. And in the army, I had one guy was saying, who was always, always messing with me, and said, what kind of Christian are you? I said, I'm a very weak Christian. <laughs> well, what does that mean? I said, I'll smack you upside your head. You get me mad. I'm very weak. If I was a good Christian, I'd have smacked my side of the head and just take it, right? I don't take it real good. Uh, I don't take it good today. I don't take it good then. Uh, but the world can always use things that, for their advantage to try to get to the Christian. Can you say amen? And uh, the Christian, did you have to let people slap you around to be a child of God? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, a lot of times in the Word of God, when, they, when, he, when Jesus was talking about the persecution of the church, he was talking about your faith. And they come in. But, but somebody, if somebody's breaking into your house, what do you do? If somebody's breaking your home, you live alone. If somebody breaks in, is trying to break into your house, what do you do as a Christian? And then you kill them. If somebody break in your house, you don't have to. Oh, I'm a crowd I'm a child of God. What shall I do? What shall I do? No, you stand up and you defend your property. You know, tear your throat out, shoot them in the head, whatever it takes. Uh, the Bible is not a pacifist book. Can you say amen? The Bible is a militant minority. Listen to me. A militant minority surrounded by a hostile majority. Dwight D. Pentecost said that. A militant minority were militant, which means we're active for the army. And we are, as children of God, a militant minority surrounded by a hostile majority. Oh, think about that. Okay? A militant minority surrounded by a hostile majority. Well, you probably you, you, then, then you, Sure, you do. And calling with Jesus is the right thing. But uh, we men, for us men to lay down, and that's my come in, and then do all kinds of things for our family, like they do on Criminal Minds. I may even watch Criminal Minds. I'm used to love it. But I don't watch it anymore because I don't, I don't want to see the crime. You know, I don't mind getting into it after the crime. But when you see the crime, Things that, I mean, people, the people in this world are crazy. Can you say amen? They are crazy. And, and, and Christian, Christian, and Christianity is not to make us pacifists. We are active, militant minorities surrounded by a hostile majority. Does the world like Christianity? No. The world wants Jesus with a twist. Can you say amen to that? 
I want Jesus with my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I want Jesus now. She's a leaving girlfriend, so I have Jesus with my fiance. That makes a difference in the world's mind. Doesn't make a bit of difference in God's mind. Jesus said, the word of God says, flee fornication. What's the difference between fornication and adultery? It's not marriage. Which one's not married? The fornication. Adultery, somebody's married and you're messing with that, with that, with that spouse. And Jesus said, if you're messing with them, then, then, I mean, then, then he brings very, very sure. But he said, every other sin is done outside the body. But not that sin. And, you know, people I deal with every day, every day, they stop calling their girlfriends that they live with girlfriends. Now they call them fiancés. That makes it okay. It doesn't make it okay in God's word. Can you say amen? We are Church of God folks. And we are by all of us. And I read this almost every week. I read, what do we believe? Because it's good for us to know. And it's good for us to see. And uh, what, what the Church of God says about what they believe, we are homeless people. And we like to live holy. Can you say amen? amen. And because we're holiness people, we become in church 14 times a week and, and, and all this kind of stuff. We live in church. And I have told people that I work with, you wouldn't even like to go to heaven. You wouldn't even like heaven. Why? All that praising going on, throwing your crowns down, tens of thousands of people praising God and lifting up the voice of God. The world doesn't even want to do that kind of stuff. Can you say amen? It does, the world does not. Now, let's turn to Exodus chapter 3. I read this, this, this book over and over and over. Somebody read for me, please. Uh, starting with uh, like verse 8. And I'm come down to deliver them. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. And I come Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the High and the and the, and the rest. Go ahead with verse nine. Now therefore behold, because the children of Israel is come unto the land which the Lord hath also seen the oppression. Now, look at verse 10. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people from the children of Israel out of Egypt. <coughs> and look what Moses said. Now, remember this. Moses was 40 years old when he killed an Egyptian. 40 years old. Then he flees to the desert, and he was there for 40 years. And like I preached last week, people wrote him off and said, Moses is done. He's 80 years old. But God was just beginning to use this 80-year-old man. And in fact, in the last chapter of Exodus, where it says, or Deuteronomy, where it says God was going to bury Moses, it says that Moses was 120 years old. His eye was not dim, neither his strength waned. And so God comes to you as me and says, I'm going to use you. He told Moses, I have heard the cry of the children of Israel. How long did it take for him to come down and deliver Israel? What I'm trying to say is this, folks. Just because God knows our need doesn't mean that he comes when we want him to. Can you say amen? He's never late, but sometimes he doesn't come when we want him to. Amen. Okay? So Moses is 80 years old. When Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, the Bible says Abraham was living in the land of us, you see. And God spoke to him and said, Get me out of that father's house, out of that kingdom. 
into a land that I will show thee. And God was speaking to Abraham, who was in retirement. And he calls him to go to a strange land. It took him 14 years to get there. And did you know what, brother? It took 14 years for God to speak to Abraham the second time. We can't even make it through Wednesday night before we, before we send it. We try to get from Sunday to Sunday. Oh, oh man, I'm going to fall apart. It, can you imagine what God did to Abraham when he met him the first time? And then he, Abraham was a, was a heathen. There was no God. There was no, no Jehovah. There was no uh, nation that believed. Abraham was the first. And when Abraham was called of God, he took his, his, his nephew with him lots. God said, leave them all. But it's the first time he spoke. And so, God speaks to Abraham. He took a lot. takes a lot. And it was 14 years later when Lot and Abraham had a conflict. And Abraham said, Lot, pick whatever place you want. I'll take the opposite. He picked the field that had the Sodom and Gomorrah in it. He picked the nice land, the field, the fields, the farmland. Abraham said, fine, I'll go to the mountain. After Lot left, the Bible says that God spoke to Abraham the second time. Eighteen years. Can you imagine what Abraham, what kind of faith? Well, his story is true. It's carried over the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. It said the faith of Abraham. And God, he said, by faith, Abraham. So, he's picking Moses, but he's 80 years old. He picks Abraham in retirement. He took a Jehovah, who was, was very, very old and very rich. And he lost everything. So God doesn't have to come to us just because we want to come today. And sometimes we say, God, we're very impatient. Would you come today? Would you let me fill me in today? It says right here, I have heard the cries. Look at this. Come now, let me send you to Pharaoh. And look at verse 11. Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh? And that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. And God said, certainly, I will be with you. Now here's another great lesson in this, in this study of Moses and God. Moses was a meek man. But Moses was not the kind of a guy to say, praise Jesus. He was the church of God. So he had questions. He more like that. The math, the, the, uh, uh, hey, anybody ever hear of R.G. Lee? R.G. Lee, the great, great pastor. He had a, a, a meeting one time with all the churches. It was a great big meeting, and he uh, started the meeting out. And R.G. Lee wrote to Pende someday. He wrote about Jezebel. R.G. Lee was a, was a very famous preacher. They said, the press came to him one time and said, I understand, R.G. Lee, that you get $25,000 a year. You're just a preacher. This is back in the day. And he said, excuse me, I don't get twenty-five. He, I get, get $50,000 a year, and I'm worth every penny of it. That was R.G. Lee. Well, R.G. Lee said, when he had this great group of this, of this meeting, were, he said, today I'm going to talk about the Mealy Mouth Methodists. And all the Pentecost said, yes, amen. He said, today I'm going to address the backbiting Baptists. And all the Pentecost said, amen. And then he said, and I'm going to also speak to the puny Pentecostal. Oh, see, he said, God has, a, well, all of us have our way. But Moses is a guy that comes to God and says, Father, I am slow of, of, of tongue. I've been out here for 40 years. And now you've asked me to go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a, is a, is a, is a king of Egypt. And he said, certainly I will be with you. Somebody read that for me, verse 12. Go ahead. And he says, Circle, I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. Then, then, that I will 
But now has brought out forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, have sent me, what is his name they're going to say? What shall I say unto them? And God said, and I love it, and it, it, it's all capitals, and God said to Moses, I am that I am. Before Moses, the name Jehovah was not in the name of the, the, the people of God. Israel knew him by different names. When he came to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. Now he comes up to, to Moses, he says, I am that I am. Thus shall God say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt, then shalt thou go to the children of Israel, thou the Lord of God in your and the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of I, 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 Isaac, Jacob, and they would say, I have sent you. Now, look at verse 16. Go and gather the children of people, the Israel together, get their elders together, and say unto them, the Lord God of your fathers, again, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you. I have even known what's happened to you here in Egypt. For 430 years, they were dead in Egypt. And then there was that other Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. Joseph's family now was 70 souls. And after 430 years, there were now three and one half million people. And they're under captivity. And when Moses goes over to talk to Pharaoh, he's going to make their life harder, not easier. You and I have to learn something about God. God doesn't always come to us at the moment we ask and deliver us. Sometimes he wants us to walk in it. Can you say amen he doesn't always deliver from cancer. He doesn't always deliver from the, from, the, from the things that we have. And he says here to Moses, in verse 17, I have said I will bring you up out of the, out of the afflictions of Egypt, into the land of Canaan, out of the, into the land of Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. But you remember, know, Brother Johnny, they were going to have to take the land. Can you say amen? There's a little play, there's a little verse where Joshua comes to stand in front of the people after God gave him the Holy Spirit. And they were getting ready to take the land and I was talking to the pastor about this and, and there's a very famous verse that says, Caleb said, give me that mountain. Caleb said, I was very young when they sent me to spy out Israel. And I was very young when they sent me to out the Canaan land. But now I'm old, but I still have my strength, and I still have my power. Give me that mountain. And brother, sister, you and I have never seen a mature Christian that has not faced obstacles. Can you say that? That's what makes us be mature Christians. And Caleb faced these people, and the Word of God says in the book of Exodus, our brethren discouraged us. It was our brethren. Ten went to spy out the land. Two came back with a report. And the Word of God says, our brethren discouraged us. And Moses said, why won't you go? Because our brethren discouraged us. He said, it's, it's too big. And then they said, we saw the Amalekites and the sons of Anak. And we were in their eyes as grasshoppers, and so were we in our eyes as grasshoppers. You know what that is? That's a grasshopper mentality. And there's those of us that can see ourselves as nothing, and the world sees us the same way. Can you say amen? When we see ourselves as we ought to be, standing strong, we have men that are 16 ounces to the pound, 36 inches to the yard. We have men that can run and, and, and do what God but we cannot be sniveling and falling apart under doing God's work. Again, we are a militant minority surrounded by a hostile majority. And this world hates us. Jesus said, the world will hate you like they hated me. 
I'm a very accommodating person. I hate conflict. I want everybody to get along. I don't want that to work. But you know what I'm finding out with the brain to work? <laughs> There's a whole lot of people that don't want to be accommodating and don't want to like me and they don't want me liking them. So I just say, well, I'm praying for you. They don't even want that. <laughs> Did you know one of the, when Jesus said, uh, take up your cross and follow me, one of the, one of the things of taking up your cross is when you have to pray for people that don't want you praying for them. That's one of the crosses that you bear. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. God said, I've seen the affliction of Israel. I've come down. He even said, I have come down to deliver you. But it took years for that to happen. Years. We want the church to grow. We want the church full now. God said, I'm going to grow your church. Brother Green preaches Sunday night. I preach Sunday morning. Brother Pastor preaches just the regular Wednesday. And all of us different ministries going on and on. We sing it. But it takes one by one by one by one to grow this church. Can you say amen? My class is already larger than when we first started. Praise God. It's not because I'm the person or he's the pastor or he's... It's because it's the Word of God. Can you say amen? It's the Word. It's the spoken Word. The breathing Word. The Logos, if you will. Now look at verse 18. And they shall hearken to thy voice. God said, you're going to listen to you, Moses. And thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. God has met with us. Oh. And now let us go. We beseech thee three days' journey to the wilderness, and let us worship. And we'll come back. Mm. I wonder about that myself. <laughs> and I am sure that the king, and, and I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and I will smite Egypt. Let, 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 me, let me cover something here. And it says on further on down here, he said, God said, I have hardened the heart of Moses, or Pharaoh. I caused the blind. I caused the deaf. I caused. God takes the responsibility for it. We hear some preachers going around saying, oh, always speak the right thing, always speak the positive thing, always. And, and all that. God said, I have made the blind. When this one young man was, was blind in the, the New Testament, the Bible says his disciples came to him and said, Jesus, who sinned? His mother or himself. Well, he was born blind, so he could have sinned. Was it his parents that sinned? No. Or was it him? And God said, This is done for the glory of God. Can you say amen? We hear so much today that's out of kilter how we can walk in divine hell. And we, how come if we walk in divine hell, those preachers and preachers that die? Moses died. Abraham died. Jacob dies. Everybody dies except for Enoch and Elisha. Other than those two, everybody. The Bible says that Moses died. He was a meekest of men. He knew God face to face. He knew God's ways. The children of Israel knew his acts. But Moses dies from the mountain. God said he died. Read Deuteronomy. Last chapter. In fact, let's go there and do it. Last chapter of Deuteronomy. Turn to it if you will. And Moses, very first verse, and Moses went up from the mountain of the plains of Micah unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pixah. That is over against Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan and all of Naphtali. Look at verse 4 in the last chapter of Deuteronomy 34. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob. Moses, I will let you see it. I've told you I will give it to your seed. 
I have caused thee to go to, to, to see with thine eyes. Watch these sublime words. But thou shalt not go over thither. Can somebody in this class tell me why Moses was not allowed to go into the land again? What happened? When they had no water, and God said, I want you to take your, your, your rod and hit the rock, and water came gushing out. Some months later, they had no water again, and God said, speak to the rock. And Moses took his rod, and he was so angry, he smiled, smote the rock again, and water came out, but God said, you're not going to go over to the promised land. Let me tell you something. The closer you get to God, the harder God is on you. Can you say amen to that? Killed your blue-eyed, your blonde-headed, blue-eyed child does not know about the things that we go through as adults. But the more we go through things, he says to him, Moses, you've never been here, you've never seen the land, but you cannot go because you disobeyed me. Look at verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. With a green eye, I see Moses in the Mount of Transfiguration like the like. I never see Enoch. But I see it in the, the two prophets in the old and in, 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 in the uh, tribulation period. I see them doing the works of Moses did and the works of Elijah. So a lot of folks think that Moses and Elijah would be the one, the two prophets in the Revelation. And then we see Moses up there on the Mount of Transfiguration. And it's, it's Moses and Elijah. Peter Rose wakes up from dead sleep and said, Oh, let's build a, a tabernacle for you and Elijah. And one for you. And God said, Be quiet. This is my son to hear him. I have caused thee to see with your eyes. You cannot go over. So Moses died. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. According to the word of the Lord, Mm, how fitting. All his life, he's lonely. All his life is in the backside of Eden. He's running into the desert. He's alone. He faces Israel. He faces his own people. He's alone so many times. And now, how fitting it is for God to say to Moses, you're going to die. And look at verse 6. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab. He buried him. Did Moses die, class? Say yes. Look at this. And no man knoweth today, no one knows today where his sepulcher is. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning were over. And I have this colored in blue, the Holy Spirit. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him and upon the children of Israel and hearkened unto him. And, and, and it did according to what Moses did. Look at verse 10. And there arose not another prophet since in Israel like unto Moses. Whom the Lord knew face to face. And folks, no matter how good we know God, if we cross that line, we suffer for it. Can you say amen? amen. Alright. So, there's no question in that Moses died. Now we're going back here to Exodus again. All right. Look at verse 13. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? 413. Or who makes the dumb? Who makes people deaf? Or the seeing? Or the blind? I, the Lord. You, I, you have marked that in your word. 
And people come to you with this, with this nonsense about, oh, just speak whatever you want to speak, and it's okay. They ignore verses like this. I made this happen. Verse 12. Now therefore go. I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what thou shalt say. And Moses said, O oh my Lord, sin, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt sin, that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. God's anger with Moses. And there's another place in this very same chapter where they go by the way, they go by the end, and all of a sudden God comes to kill him, Moses. And his wife, Sephora, steps in and circumcises her son and throws the circumcised, the circumcised part at the feet of Moses and said, Thou art a bloody husband to me. And God said, Okay, I'll let you live. What am I trying to say, folks? We have to respect God no matter how good we know it. Nobody is above us with God. Can you say amen? Nobody knows God where you can just live sloppy lives or just say, well, God and me. They, I asked, I asked Jamie something. This is a true story. He was up here at Franklin Baptist Church. And he came up there and he was getting out of the bus. He went in there and sang and he, he kept mentioning Elvis Presley. And he said, we, we have sung to more people because we were behind Elvis Presley than any other quartet. And I asked J.D. some of these, this very question. J.D. Summer was Elvis saying. His answer was, he did not have to be saved. He had a special deal with God. Now, J.D. Summer, I'm quoting I, I promise you that. Let me ask this class. Did he have a special deal with God? He is splitting hell wide open today unless he was saved. Can you say amen? Whitney Houston grew up in church, singing and praising God, but she dies drunken, drunk, drunk, and drunk, and, and slid down into the water and died. Unless she made her peace with God, she's in hell. No one goes to heaven unless you're ready to go to heaven. Can you say amen to that? I don't care how great you are. Can you somebody said you didn't have to be saved. They had a special deal. Nobody's that rich. Even Moses is saying, you're sitting right here. And God said, Moses, I'm angry with you. And Moses was saying, send my sin, send somebody else. Send somebody else. And the anger of the Lord was killed against Moses. And he said, isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? I know he can talk. And behold, he's coming to see you. And then God puts it there. He's going to be happy that he sees you. God is always a personal God. Always a personal God. And he will be happy. He will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto Aaron and say, I'm going to put words in your mouth. And I'll tell you what God has told me and I'm going to tell it to you so you can turn around and tell Pharaoh. Verse 16. And he shall be thy spokesman under the people, and even as angry as God was with Moses, he still let Aaron come. Brother Mickey, that just shows me the, the personality of God. God knows that we're weak. God knows that we're just flesh. God knows that we're, that we're just ourselves. So he worked with us. Verse 18, And Moses went and returned unto Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me take, take my journey, I pray thee, and return to my brothers in, in Egypt, and see whether or not they be alive. And Jethro said unto Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go, return unto Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. 
And Moses took, look verse 20, we're in 420. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return unto Egypt, see thou do all these things, all these wonders which I have told you about. But I will harden Moses of Pharaoh's heart, that he will not let thee go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn, and I say unto thee, Let my people go, that they may serve me, and if thou refuse to let them go, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn, and it came to pass in the way. Now, now, now notice these next three verses. This is very, very important. Does anybody know what a parenthetical passage is? Go ahead. There's a lot of these in the Revelation. God, James, God is talking to us about the 144,000 because it's a parenthetical passage. He's talking about the great, all the great woes and all the great trumpet judgments. And all of a sudden he says, oh, by the way, I want to talk about the 144,000. Oh, by the way, I want to talk about the new prophets. And this is a parenthetical passage. It doesn't fit in the book of, the book of Exodus. It doesn't even fit here. It's a parenthetical passage, which means it's a passage where he's saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I want to tell you about this before I go on. Something like your teacher does. <laughs> I have a lot of parenthetic facts. Uh, look at here. Verse 24. Read this. This is very important. And it came to pass, by the way, in the end, mm, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. This is Moses. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely thou art a bloody husband to me. So God let him go. Then she said again, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Brother, I believe that Zipporah was, was not a Christian at the time. And when Moses buried her, then he had a son. I believe it was because he was very lackadaisical with his kids. Did you folks know that we can, we're not supposed to be lackadaisical with our kids when it comes to religious things? And you say, amen. We're supposed to say to our kids, you're going to go to church. And we talked about this morning. Church, you go to church and, and uh, be away for 40 years and come back. It's the same old people doing the same old thing. But, it, but, but that's not the reason we go or don't go. We go because we're told to go to church. Forsake not the assembly ourselves together. Bring all the high ties into the storehouse. This is where we go to expose ourselves to the Word. But Moses was like a day ago with this young boy. He said, well, I know we're all supposed to be circumcised, but it's okay. It wasn't okay. Now, I ask you, is there anything in your life where you've told someone it's really okay and the Lord will nudge you and say, get it right? Get it right? Look at verse 27. And the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and, 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 and met him in the mount of God and he kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words the Lord had said. Look at verse 29. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words that the Lord had told them, given to Moses. And did the signs in the sight of the people. Watch this beautiful thing. And the people believed. And the people believe. Did you know this? This is what revival does when it comes to the church. Revival helps us to believe what we already know. Can you say that? 
Revival gets rid of the sin. Revival gets rid of, uh, of our lackadaisical ways. Revival brings us to a place where we begin to believe again. And because we're human beings, we always have a bent not to believe. We have to work on believing. Did you know if you did, did anybody here ever say, well, I don't have to teach my children until two, two is four? <clears throat> yes, you do. And I've heard people all my life say, well, when it comes to religion, I'll let my child make up his own mind. Is that a good thing? It is not. Strain of a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Strain of a child. And what does it mean when he's, when he's, when he's old? When he's mature. And when is maturity? 12, 15, 38? The Bible doesn't say when maturity comes. Some of, us, some of you have husbands who are still not mature. Amen. Oh, I, see. <laughs> I saw six women go. Yes. <laughs> uh, I tell you what, I used to preach about this in, my, in, in the Assemblies of God. I would see this young lady would have a baby, maybe if she has two babies. And uh, the guy wakes up in one Sunday morning, he's watching Jimmy Swagger, but Jimmy Swagger was still a good guy back then. He'd be watching Jimmy Swagger, and uh, he said to his wife, give me a biscuit, honey. And she'd be in there, she'd be making this kid get dressed, and this kid get dressed, and this kid get dressed, and then this kid has to take a bath, but she just spit over herself and get dressed again. And then she goes out and does this, and he, he's scratching it. Well, baby, can you bring me another egg? You know, and then she'd bring it and serve him, and he was sitting there, and, and all of a sudden he'd get up and he'd get ready, and she's done fixing all three kids and gotten them all ready. And now he gets up and got himself ready and scratches, and he's gonna go out to the car. So he walks out the car, he blows his horn about nine times because here comes the little wife with all the kids, all the diaper bags, everything going, and he's ready to go to church. Pray, Jesus. They get to church. She takes all the babies and goes to classes and different ones and gives them milk here, the, the bottles here, and the makeup here, and the food here. And she comes in. Finally, she comes in and sits in the front of the church, sits down, and her hair is kind of down in her face. And he looks over and says, Why, well, you don't look too religious. <laughs> <laughs> he should, she should have beat him in the head with a two bottle. <laughs> How many women remember those days? Oh. See, we husbands can be so, so wrong, <laughs> even though we love Jesus. And I used to tell those folks, I say, folks, I, I, I want to see you men carry the babies. I want to see you men. And you know what happened in the Assemblies of God? I had a lot of young men who were helping their wives out because we preached about those things. You can preach about that stuff. It's called Christian living. The people believe. Chapter 4, verse 31. And the people believe. And the people believe. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, and then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Oh, oh, to worship. God centered. Lord, you are God. I want to praise for anything that's happened to me. I want to ask for anything that I need. I don't want to confess. I don't want to intercede. I want to petition. I want to worship. And one of the last things in that circle of the that we will circle the beat that we've had and covered for three weeks was worship. And folks, after you pray and you've been with God for, for 30, 40, 50 minutes, then you can get to the place where, you, where you're meditating on the Word of God and all of a sudden you can worship. And brother and sister, when we raise our hands, the Bible says raise holy hands without doubting, without wrath. Holy hands! And when we've been in the Word of, the word of God, we've been in prayer, we've read the Word, we've sang the Word, and we've done all these elements, then we can worship. And the people of God worshipped. Look at verse 5 or chapter 5. I'm getting ready to close. And as afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. Verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Just like the Jews, Who is the Lord? Folks, 
these are sermons after sermons after sermons. Oh, there's a lot of preaching. Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord. Hmm. Neither will I let Israel go. At least he was honest. Can you say amen? He was honest as a lot of folks we deal with every day that pretends to be Christians and go to church. And I've heard a lot of guys say, I don't go to but my wife does. I don't go to Central, but my wife goes. Our sister drives a forklift. She's heard it there, there in, in my car. Well, I don't go myself, but my family goes. And they said, the God of the Hebrews have met with us. You don't know God, but He's met with us. And I'm going to close by saying this. They came a little black man. And he said, how come you're always singing your songs? How come you say that God is real? How can you, a black man, poor as you are, can't hardly take care of your family? How do you know God is real? And the old black man said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know all about the, the theologies and the, and the philosophies. But I'm going to tell you what, I talked to God this morning. That's how I know He's real. Can you say amen? My time is over. Let's stand your feet. How do you know I talked to Him this morning?